Hello and welcome to EGM 702, Week 4, Part 4, Multitemporal Classification. Before I jump into multitemporal classification, I'm going to say a little bit about post-classification comparison. Now the way that this works is that we have two or more images. So we have an image from 1990, we have an image from 2014, and then we classify our image from 1990 we classify our image from 2014, and then we compare the two different classified images. So we're comparing the classifications. Now, one thing that's uh, very useful about this, or that has there is an one advantage that this technique has, is that the definition of change and no change is quite clear. So we we know, for example, that if we have a pixel that was classified as forest in 1990, and it's classified as something else in 2014, we know what that change is. Other techniques like change vector analysis, we have to do that interpretation um, as we go. Uh, whereas when we're comparing already classified images, of course, the classification has already been done for us. The disadvantage here is that this is highly dependent on the classification accuracy. So if we have two different image classifications that are not particularly accurate, then there's going to be a lot of noise and it's going to be very difficult to actually uh, correctly uh, or accurately compare those two classifications. We're not going to be able to, to draw as much information out of there, or potentially not able to draw as much information out of there. One alternative to post-classification comparison is something called multi-temporal classification. Now this is where we take our image acquired at time one and our image acquired at time two, and we combine it into a single stacked image and then we perform our classification using that stacked image. So we could do a supervised classification like what you covered in EGM 713. We could also do unsupervised classification or clustering. And what we're classifying here is not just, we're, we're not just assigning classes to the pixels, we're also uh, differentiating between whether these are classes, these are pixels that have changed classes from time one to time two, or if they have stayed the same. So we're classifying both change classes and non-change classes. One thing to think about when we're doing this is how similar our change class or how similar our change pixels are to our non-change pixels, because that's going to be important in the final classification analysis. We can use this technique uh, in conjunction with principal component analysis. So once we have our stacked image data, we can run a principal component analysis on, uh, on, those, or on that image stack. We can then do a traditional classification on the principal component image, or we can look at individual principal component bands and try to threshold um, those or to interpret those changes. Um, or interpret those different uh, principal components. This is very useful in that it helps to reduce redundancy or dimensionality, but it can also be much, a, much the same way that principal component analysis can be very difficult to interpret for images from a single point in time. Interpreting uh, principal components for change images can also be uh, very difficult. Uh, we can also again use this for change detection if we so choose. To help think about a multi-temporal classification, uh, we'll run through a short simple example here. So the example being that we have snowfall and melt in between two different images and we're looking specifically at the red band or the uh, visible red uh, wavelengths and we know that fresh snow has a very high reflectance in the visible bands, in visible wavelengths, whereas grass has a fairly low reflectance in visible red wavelengths. So now, when we're looking at these differences between time one and time two, 
the pixels that are constant, that don't change between time 1 and time 2, are going to lie along this diagonal. So we have a cluster of pixels uh, that have fairly, fairly low values in both time 1 and time 2. So we think that these are probably going to be our pixels representing grass. Pixels that have fairly high reflectance values at time 1 uh, and time 2 are going to be snow um, in both, both images. And then off of the diagonal is where we have our changed classes. So this is where we have pixels that have changed from one class to another. So for example, um, pixels that have a low red value at time two, but a high red value at time one are going to be pixels that have moved from snow to grass. So this is where we've, got, we've had snow that has melted. And perhaps we have also pixels where we have had snow fall. And so we have low values in time one, high values in time two, and this is where we've seen grass be covered over by snow. If we look at the multi-temporal multi -temporal principle component analysis, typically the first one or two principal components that we're looking at are going to be stable, so they're going to represent the, the constant pixels primarily. And then the third and fourth principal components are going to represent pixels that have changed. Now in this example, principal component two is actually the, um, the image or the principal component where the change has taken place, and principal component one is our stable component. And then we have some additional information uh, that comes in from the other principal components. But um, especially when you start looking at principal component 5 and 6, you can see that this is mostly sensor noise that we're seeing. So now, um, the, which principal component has which change or how much change is going to depend on the amount of change that we can see uh, in between the two different images. And similarly to the visible change analysis, we can threshold between change and no change uh, using these principal components. So if we look at three different ways of looking at changes between two different images, we have a band difference between uh, an image at time, or I think in 2000 and 2003, we have the principal component, uh, the second principal component, as a result of the principal component analysis of the stacked 2000 and 2003 images. And then we have a decorrelation stretch of the first three principal components. And what you'll notice here is that areas where we have a strong difference between the two different bands correspond to where we have a high value in our second principal component, which also corresponds to areas where we have this sort of green color because in the decorrelation stretch principal component 2 or high values of principal component 2 are going to have high values in the green color in the image. So if we look at for example this area up here where we've had um, the lake level drop and so we have um, we, we have land that is exposed we see that this is represented by this uh, positive change from one image to the next, which is also <clears throat> which is also represented by the um, by high values in the second principal component, represented also by the green values in the decorrelation image. We also have areas where we have the opposite, where we have had a decrease in reflectance between the two different images, represented also by dark colors in the second principal component, and represented by these sort of dark blue-purple colors in the decorrelation stretch. To sum all of this up, um, post-classification comparison can be much easier to interpret than some of the other change detection techniques that we've looked at but it can also be very noisy or inaccurate. One solution to, that, that we can have to this is to use our classification techniques 
on the stacked multi-temporal data, uh, which is going to give us information about pixels that have stayed the same between time one and time two, as well as pixels that have changed classes. We'll have to do a little bit of additional work to actually identify what those changes represent. Uh, we can do this with supervised or unsupervised classification, and we can also do this with principal component analysis. Uh, additional resources here, uh, again, uh, looking in Chapter 7 of Lillis and Kiefer and Chipman, and Chapter 12 of Jensen, as well as a number of different papers. Uh, the San Jose Garcia paper uh, is an example of a post-classification analysis. Um, these other papers, uh, Heme et al., uh, 1998, Selleck, 2009, Collins and Woodcock, 1996, are all examples of multi-temporal classification, um, so you can have a look at those on Blackboard. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found this interesting, and if you have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.